Right. So last time I introduced this dual picture of mutation. So if you remember, on the N side, you took your polytope, you put a grading in, you sliced it up, and you redistributed some stuff. And on the M side, it turns out to be a piecewise linear transformation. Okay? So I just want to begin today by redoing one of the examples from yesterday and just to see what's happening on the M side. So if you remember, yesterday we had this cone over the hexagon. Maybe the origin's there and here. Okay, and this is inside the lattice N. So let me just give it a few values. So here we have 1, minus 1, 1. This is the same picture from yesterday. Okay, and one of the mutations we did yesterday, we had H was 0, 0, minus 1, and then I factor A. I'm going to be a little bit more careful about it today. I'm going to draw a picture of my factor. So it looked like this. Okay, so I'm just going to take the standard syntax in the two-dimensional plane, passing through the origin. Okay, so now I want to dualize. So I'm going to write down P dual, and this is inside the dual lattice. I don't know if you've seen this before. All you need to do is you need to look at these maximum dimensional facets and just figure out what the support in hyperplanes are and orientate them so that I choose to have inner pointing normals. So if I do this, with this example, it's actually not so tedious. Okay, so this is what I end up with. So I'm going to draw a picture of it. And it kind of looks suspiciously similar to this, but that's really just um, coincidence. I'm going to use a lot of blackboard space for this. So I'm going to draw it in. It occupies three layers, like that one does. And on the top, it still looks like a hexagon. I said now it's a hexagon dilated twice. Okay. Then on the middle slice, where the origin is, it just looks like a hexagon. And then there's just a single vertex at the bottom. So I'm going to try and draw that. So I'm first just going to try and draw the top slice. All right, so at the top, already another success. At the top, so it looks like this twice dilated hexagon. I'll just label some of the vertices. So this is minus 2, minus 2, 1. And um, this one here is 2, 0, 1. This one here is 2, 2, 1. And, well, this one here is 0, P1, and just sitting here in the middle is um, 0, 0, 1. Okay? And then let me just drop down. This is where the origin is going to live. And then down one more to the point 0, 0, minus 1. Then just join all these up. So like I say, it looks basically the same as that.
Okay? And then just at this middle slice, there's another hexagon living here where the um, points are on the rays. All right. So how does this um, dual picture of mutation act on it? Well, what I need to do, if you remember, I need to take the inner normal fan of, um, of my factor. So, well, it's easier to draw the normal fan first, which looks like that. And then I just need to negate everything. So I need to try and draw this in three dimensions. So what's happening is there's going to be a linear space through here, and this linear space is just the span of my grading vector, h, and then I'm going to try and draw that fan on this picture so it looks like this. So I'm going to draw it up here first. Then I'm just going to draw it down here. Then I'm going to have a go at connecting it all up. So it looks like this. And then Okay, I don't know if you can see that. So I've tried to draw that fan in this picture. So it's a, one of the walls of the chambers is passing through here and coming down. Then there's another wall of the chamber so I'm heading towards you and it's passing through here. And then the final wall of the chamber is going back into the black bar and it's passing through here. Cool. And then, like I said um, yesterday, within each of these um, chambers, the mutation just acts as a linear transformation. So I'm just going to write it as a matrix. So here in this back chamber, all it's going to act like is via the matrix 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay? Here in this front chamber, It's just acting by 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, no, 0, 1, 0, and then 0, 1, 1. And then in this chamber here, it's just the identity, okay? And it's the identity in there precisely because that's the chamber that corresponds to the origin in my factor. Okay? So I can always just translate the factor to bring it up so that a chamber is um, just the identity. And then, well, you can see from the picture, what happens is this point here gets moved down to here. And then this point here is going to get moved down to here. And then this point back here is going to move to there. And we're going to end up with this little square um, base here. Okay. And the interesting thing is mutation is having the effect of flattening out this edge um, flattening out um, this edge and flattening out this edge. Okay? It takes it and it just opens it out to make it nice and smooth. And so what we get after this, q okay, it's just going to be isomorphic to um, three times, the, um, three times? Um, no, twice the dilation of a cube. And then okay. All right. 
And this has volume equal to 3 factorial times by 8. Yep. And um, if I count, then, so this is equal to minus k x q cubed, and it has so many lattice points. What does it have? It has q dual intersect m. So it's got 27 lattice points. And this is equal to h naught of minus k x q. Okay. And as before, maybe you recognize this from, you know, looking at toric varieties before, but this is the um, dual for P1 cross P1. And P1 cross P1 cross P1. So because it works as a piecewise linear transformation, there's an immediate corollary. And that's basically, if we take P to be a final polytope, and if we take a mutation of it, then the sort of minus K numerics are unchanged. So we have the degree is unchanged. And we have the Hilbert series is unchanged. So in other words, H naught of successive dilations is unchanged. exactly what we'd expect. We're expecting that XP and XQ are um, QG deformation equivalent. And so sort of QG deformations, uh, well, I don't know if characterize is too strong a word, but they preserve the numerics of minus K. So this is what we expect. All right, okay, so that's um, what's going on in three dimensions. In two dimensions, as you might imagine, the situation's a lot simpler a lot more easy to sort of get a hold of what's going on and prove some stuff. I just want to focus on this now. So, I'll try and be clear about if I say anything that's true in general, okay? But sort of take everything that I say as just being true in dimension two. So I want to return to the mutation that we had before, where we took P2 and we sent it to P114. Okay. So um, let's just recall that P2 um, is sent to is um, sent to P114 via um, the mutation via a mutation. I need more part space. Okay, so it's via this mutation. So I'm gonna just fix a basis and I'm gonna have H is minus one, two, and I'm going to have A is just this line segment from the origin up to um, 2, 1. Okay. And we did the picture in N before, but we'll do it again. So this is P, this is going to be P2. And I start with this final polygon. And the fan is just the spanning fan, which is how I know it's P2. Okay. And then 
my h that I've chosen imposes a grading on the lattice. And we drew them before I'll draw them again. This is going to be at height minus 1, height 0, height 1, and height 2. When we do this mutation, when we do this mutation, we end up with P one one two P one one four, which is one two three four five. stick the origin here and I can track that and I stick two copies of it at height 2 it looks like this and you may not believe me but that's going to be a straight line I'm only meant to have this point so again you know I draw the fan I want to it looks like this. And the sort of little remark is, whereas before all the cones were smooth, here two of the cones are smooth, but this cone becomes a singular cone. It's a quarter, one, one singularity. Okay. All right. So what do we get in the dual picture? Don't think I'm going to squeeze the dual underneath. I'll have to just do it on an adjacent board. Well, so again, I'm going to put my P2 here. I'll put my P114 here. So the dual to that triangle is a triangle you've seen before, but in a different context. I have this. And here's the origin. And my H that I've chosen looks like this. Maybe I should emphasize, unlike a ratio, when I write the um, diamond brackets, I really do mean linear span. I don't mean cone. Okay. I think we sorted that out, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And mutation, how does it act on these two chambers? Well, you know, I'll just again write it as a matrix. It goes 3 minus 4, 1 minus 1 on this side. And on this side, it's just the identity. So, you know, again, it's just the identity because this vertex is 0. And let me just associate some of these vertices to the edges over there. So this edge here, I'm going to, I'm sorry, this vertex here, I'm going to label as U1. And through duality, it corresponds to this edge here. Okay. Now, this edge here corresponds to this edge here, uh, this vertex here. And so this vertex here is going to correspond to this edge here. Let me just apply this mutation. Get my P114. 
Now, this is um, a rather big lattice. So I need to draw a seven by seven lattice, okay? So this is gonna be a little break. Okay. What does it look like in here? Well, I, you know, I suppose, pedagogically speaking, we should take this and we should dualize it, but forget that. I'm just going to apply this linear transformation. Okay. So what are we going to get? The origin is here in my picture. And I get this. And See Daisy. Try again. It looks like this. Let me just draw that vector. Oh, that um linear space back in. So it's passing through here, I think. Yeah. Okay. So again, let me just associate these vertices of the dual polytope with my edges. Um, so we've got U1 prime, U3 prime there, and U2 prime there. And then over here, what do we have? We have E1 prime. This must be, whoops, I've drawn it on the wrong picture, aren't I? It's over here, E1 prime, E2 prime. And then here is E3. And again, notice that just here were, um, just around here, where we had our U1 mutation has flattened it out. Okay? So here, mutation um, has flatten the boundary. Okay, so we saw that in this case, it took three edges and it just flattened them out. And here, it, it's just taken this corner and it's just flattened it out. All right. So now I'll say something that's true in all dimensions. It's just a, um, a fact of duality. So under duality, the cone, um, let's call it CE, which is just one of the cones in my fan that spans facet E, okay? So over the facet, or A facet, E of P, okay? So it's dual to the matching tangent cone in the dual picture, okay? So um, is dual to the tangent cone uh, 
at the corresponding vertex. I could try and give you a definition. Um, I'm not going to. I think it's just easily illustrated. So, for example, let's just look at P2 again. Okay. And let me just pick one of the cones. I don't really care which one. I'm going to choose this cone here. Okay. So, this is my cone. C E. Then in the dual picture, okay. Well, this edge E corresponds to this vertex here, I hope. And then the tangent cone is just this cone here. Okay. So it's equal to C E dual, and then just translated. And C E dual is just defined to be all those vectors u. Um, that evaluate to a non-negative value against the original cone. Okay. All right, why am I telling you this? <laughs> okay. I'm telling you this because, and again, this is true in all dimensions, if the vertex of the dual polytope is strictly inside one of our chambers, then it's just being acted on by a linear transformation. And so the tangent cone is completely unchanged. Okay? And so in other words, up to a change of basis, the corresponding cone back in the fan is also unchanged by mutation. And the only exciting stuff happens on the walls of the chamber. Let me try and write that down. So F, V, oh, sorry, I call them U's. U, E, and vertices of P dual is in the interior of a chamber. Then um, C, E, in N is unchanged. Okay. So when I say unchanged, there's a change of basis going on, but you know the singularity that the cone describes, that's not changed. Coming back to dimension two, well, in dimension two, the only non-trivial factors you can have are line segments like this, and so we always just have um, the dual lattice split into two halves, and so there's not a lot of scope for excitement. Basically, the excitement happens here and here, and everything else just gets shuffled around a bit. In dimension two, um, we need only think about this 
and the corresponding top and bottom of P. Because everything else is just getting a little change of basis. So here's the top, and here's the bottom of my polytope. And there's just a bunch of stuff happening between. The top and the bottom slices corresponding to the two points in this are, you know, I'm just going to put there. And this is a picture in N, I should say. Oh, here's the origin. This is in N. Okay. And I'm going to Use my H to be grading in that direction. So I've rigged it up so that my mutation says I need to remove a factor from here and add a factor in down here, and everything else just moves around the corner. So let me just draw my cone that I want to think about. So if this is my edge E, I want to look at this cone, and this is my cone. And well, I should have said, I want this to be a Fano polytope. So I'll just say P Fano polygon. And with respect to our grading, this is at um, a negative height. Let me label these row one and row two. So this is at a negative height. So I can just write it as minus r. And then this is at a positive height. So I'm just going to call this s. And I've called this little edge E. I'm just going to call this edge here an F. Okay. No, I'm drawing an edge down here. It might just be a single vertex. It's not going to make any difference to what I'm doing. But I can only sketch what I'm doing. I can't really give it you as um, a proof. It's not worth the time. And I'm just going to look at the length, the lattice length of this edge. Okay. So I'm going to call this L. And it's just going to be the number of lattice points along this edge, subtract one. This value r here is just the Gorenstein index of the singularity corresponding to CE, if you know what I'm talking about. So r is the Gorenstein index. of the singularity e, e. And apologies in advance, I'm just going to confuse the distinction between a cone and the corresponding singularity. Okay. That's my setup. And my aim is to understand what happens when I mutate something out of this and put it down to that. So I'm going to assume that my factor A, which is contained in H perp, 
So my A is contained in here. Um, it's just a line segment of length one. Lattice length one. And it turns out that whether or not a mutation exists given data H and A is purely a local property of this cone. And really, the whole of the rest of the polytope is irrelevant. Now, I have to emphasize that is absolutely not true in high dimensions. But two dimensions is nice, and it's true. So whether H A um, gives a mutation. of P or not, um, it turns out to be purely local property of, of C, E, or of E. There's no distinction. Okay, and so just a warning, not true. Bigger than two. I just want to sketch for you what's going on. Let's let me convince you in words. Remember, this has been sliced up into a bunch of um, well, slices, strips, and we're allowed to mutate if at each of these strips I can remove an appropriate multiple of A, where that multiple is just the height of that strip. Okay? So here I need to be able to remove R copies of a line segment, and then at the next height down I need to be able to remove R minus 1 copies, R minus 2 copies, etc., etc. Okay. And also, if you remember in the definition, I said it just didn't matter how we chose our remainder terms. And so it turns out that a lot of the time, we're basically free to um, choose a bunch of empty slices. The only problem is if there's some vertices. I'm not going to go into any of those details. I'll just point you at a paper where you can read the details if you want. Okay. But the upshot of this is basically we can do the mutation so long as this length L um, is bigger than R. Okay. Just what you expect. So, i.e., if and only if um, R is less than or equal to. And I'm, for obvious reasons, I'm going to call this the length. And I'm going to call this, well, the height of the Gorenstein index. I don't care. And what happens when I do that? Well, the mutation well, it shortens the length by R. Okay? And then down at the bottom, I increase the length of F by S. Moved it from upstairs and I've shoved it in downstairs. And everything else in between just gets shuffled around a bit but basically doesn't change. It's... Um, well, we saw the, the rest of them just lie strictly inside chambers of the dual picture. And so this means that if I basically figure out how long each of my edges are and work out how many times the height goes into the edge, and do that for every edge all the way around, I've got a mutation invariant. Because when one of them shrinks by its height, one downstairs grows by its height. 
So for each edge E, let me just write, no, this is a little pedantic, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to write the length of E as um, so many multiples of the height of E plus some remainder. And so what do we have here? We have C, E, K, E, they're in the non-negative integers. And I want 0 to be less than or equal to C, E, to be less than R, E. Okay. Then um, I'm just going to write, ooh, it's a shame. Let me call it N. N equal to the sum of all these KEs is invariant under and so is these collection of the little remainders that's left over. So let me try and sort of give a toric view of what I'm saying. Here is my cone C. And here is two rays. And it's at height R. And I'm saying that I can subdivide it into K cones that are all of the same um, length and height. So I can just go chomp, chomp, Jump, and there'll be maybe a little bit left over at the end. So what I've done here is I have K cones of length equals height equals R. And then here we have 0 or 1, depending on whether C is 0 or not, um, remainder cone. OK, so this has length C, E, but height C and height R. And so I'm going to call these R cones. And I'm going to call these P cones. That's probably a bit low for some people. I'll just um, state the definition over here. So we call C a T cone if the length is equal to the height, the Gorenstein index. And we call the a R cone if the length is less than the height. Why have I bothered doing this? Well, the point is that mutation is just shuffling around these T cones and leaving these R cones untouched. So if I take the set of all the R cones I end up with after doing this subdivision, so let's let B be the set of the R cones um, of P, and this is after doing that subdivision, Then, oh, and I suppose, and, and as before, it's just equal to the number of T cones. OK. 
Okay, then actually this pair n and b is a mutation invariant. And we call this the singularity content. Right, okay, yeah. I, I mean what this cone is as a singularity, okay? Or what this cone is, but don't care about how I've put it into the basis, okay? But it's slightly more information than just the CE. Cool. So geometrically, what's going on? So um, these T cones are basically the same thing. There's a slight white line going on. But basically, these T cones are the same thing as T singularities. Um, which are all of the form 1 over R squared 1 R um, D minus 1 where G C D Rd is equal to 1. And these things were studied by Carlos Shepard-Baron back in 88. And the point of them are they're precisely the smoothable two-dimensional toric singularities. Okay. So these correspond to the smoothable Um, toric, um, so she would say quotient things. So from our point of view, this begins to sound kind of believable. And the QG deformation, what we're probably doing is we're smoothing away all of the T cones, and we're just left with these, this collection B of um, R cones or singularities. And indeed, that's the case. Okay. So. We have um, P with singularity content equals NP. Um, so, so that's that. Then we have XP um, um, QG um, deforms. to a del pezzo, or before del pezzo, I guess, X um, with Euler number N and QG rigid singularities B. That's what's going on. Um, I should probably give you some references for some of this before we just finish off. The references all on the archive. I'm going to point you at three papers. So 1401, 5458, and then... Um, Yeah, okay, I said, but unfortunately I've not written down the rest of them. I'm going to point you at one paper, okay, and the rest you can Google for. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we've got this beautiful um, invariant, and so it makes sense to say, let me try and classify all polygons that have given singularity content. Okay. So we can try and classify them all.
And we're going to have to do this up to mutation. And this is doable, okay? This is really something that you can do. And it turns out that there's only finitely many. Um, there's only finitely many mutation equivalence classes. I don't know if you realize quite how cool this is. So one can say, go away and find me a bunch of toric models for Del Petzels that have blah de blah, -de -blah singularities. And you can do it, okay? There's an algorithm that just lets you go away and produce them all, and there's just going to be finitely many answers. And the proof is constructive. And so it makes sense to um, just start working your way through the simplest possible rigid singularities, R comps. So the simplest or smallest R comp is a third one. Let me draw a picture. So it's the cone that goes like um, so it's supporting hyperplane is just passing through here. This is what a third one one singularity looks like. And so you can go away and you can find all the Fano polygons up to mutation that have third one one singularities, and everything else just the T-singularity. So, um, I should, you thought I had a reference for this T, but I don't, apparently. So we can classify all final polygons up to mutation with singularity content equal to, we don't care how many T cones, and then some number, Jay's doing a lot of work, um, some number M of third one one. Singularities. And it turns out that there's only finitely many mutation equivalence classes. There's exactly 26 of them. And you can see those 26 mutation equivalence classes on the problem sheet. Okay. And so this is really great. Let me draw a few of them because I want to carry on studying them tomorrow. I'm going to draw three of them. Chosen pretty much at random. So these are just three representatives in three different mutation equivalence classes. Here is the origin. Remember, these are pictures in N. So it makes sense for me to just draw the spanning fan just to remind you. So here is one of them. Okay. Now, as a total variety, this has got a singularity here that's not a third one one. The point is that I can smooth all of that away in this way to give me something that's just a third one one. Okay. Um, let me draw another one. Uh, 
So this one, you know, like this, it's very similar, but except now I've moved the origin <laughs> to here. So the fan, in this case, looks like this. And then one more, this one's a bit of a beast. So what does it look like? Okay, so again, it's seven across. Seven down. And actually, I only need the diagonal. I only need the upper triangular path, so. And it looks like this. And the origin now is sitting here. So the fan looks like this. Now that is apparently on that side of the ray. <laughs> and this is apparently on this side of the ray. And I guess it's kind of an exercise for you to go away and calculate the singularity content in three cases, but I'm just going to write it up for each one. So this one has got five T cones, and then it's got a single third one, one singularity. And in fact, I can see that third one, one singularity. It's this cone here. This one has got six T cones. And it also just has a single third one one singularity. And again, I see that third one singularity, it's just this cone here. And then finally, this one, well, this one has also got just six T cones. And um, you might sort of at first just think it's only got a single third one one singularity there, but in fact, there's some more hidden in there if you go through the um, decomposition of the cones. It ends up having three the third one, one singularities. Okay. So just to finish off, this is really good. We've got 26 um, mutation equivalent polygons, which are the only ones in the whole universe that have these third one, one singularities. But how can we understand them as del pencils, right? How can we sort of smooth them? And the obvious answer is we want to be able to make toric complete intersection models from them. So just to sort of finish, the question now is, how can we make um, toric complete intersection models um, for x given one of these p? Or a closely related question, if you give me one of these p, how can I put a Laurent polynomial on it in a sensible way so that I recover the period sequence for x? How can I do all of that? All right, so stop there.